Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. This year, we celebrate the centennial of the birth of Zbigniew Herbert in 1924 in the city of Lviv, which today is Lviv in contemporary Ukraine. A poet, essayist, and dramatist for theater and radio, he received much of his secondary and university education through the underground flying university courses that had already become a practiced Polish tradition during the partition period when Poland was completely absorbed by Austria, Prussia, and Russia at the end of the 18th century. After the war, Herbert studied art and philosophy and received degrees in economics and law. Though a few poems appeared in 1950, he pretty much managed to wait out the Stalinist period of obligatory socialist realism before contributing to the highly respected semi-independent weekly Tygodnik Powszechny and to domestic and emigre literary monthlies. Only after the thaw of 1956 was his first book of poems published, and he began traveling widely. He got a one-year visiting fellowship in Los Angeles in 1970-71. In 1975, he signed a major open letter protesting ominous changes to the Polish constitution, which led to additional longer sojourns abroad. During the first solidarity period in 1981, Herbert joined the editorial board of the literary journal Zapis, the title of which refers to the regulations cited when passages were censored from the press. It was co-founded in 1976 by Adam Zagajewski and others as a clandestine venue for works banned by the communist authorities. Herbert is a metaphysical poet who takes a detached stance to question the meaning of existence in the face of political power, violence, the march of history, and death. But he also takes and offers comfort in the broader context of a history that embraces such reassuring constants as Socrates and Marcus Aurelius. Herbert has a genius for blending pathos with irony, for presenting great metaphors through the poetry of everyday speech. He is perhaps most widely associated with his book of poems called Mr. Cogito and subsequent collections that frequently feature this air of the Enlightenment, a quintessentially critical, rational person who struggles to address problems of our times only to realize that they do not easily lend themselves to rational solutions. Report from the Besieged City, a collection published in Paris in 1983, struck an exceptionally deep chord among Poles under martial law following the crackdown on solidarity. Herbert also authored four collections of prose writings which display his outsider's intuition, irony, and perceptive eye in musings on ancient civilizations, philosophical parables, and investigations of art, culture, and history inspired by journeys through France Italy, and the Netherlands. The poet Charles Simic writes of Herbert, the traveler, quote, as a foreigner and a kind of amateur scholar, he sees in artworks what professional academics and natives do not. We are led by an eye that reacts in a fresh and inspired way to objects and events that do not exist for the practical eye, end of quote. What he finds, though, I think, as a detached outsider is a sense of belonging a recognition within himself that he too partakes of the legacy of European culture. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to remind you to subscribe. If you like our series, click the bell to receive notifications about new episodes and follow our playlist down in the description below to catch up on past episodes. Bojana Shalcross has been our guest for episodes on Gombrovich and Stanislav Lem, so you can go back to those episodes where she is thoroughly introduced, but we'll ask for an update at the end of the program to find out what she's been up to most recently. But just the basics, Bojena is Professor of Polish Literature and Polish-Jewish Cultural Studies in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Chicago, as well as an essayist, translator, and art critic with a long-standing interest in the verbal and the visual, which is perfectly well-suited to the work of of Herbert. Bojena, welcome back to Encounters with Polish Literature. Hello, I am very happy to be back, and uh, I think that the the reason for being back is is you know is um, a source of my constant uh, affirmation, admiration, and joy. I will never cease to like Zbigniew Herbert's poetry. 
Me too. I'm glad. I'm glad we've had a chance to work on it before, and that we're we're coming back again um, when we uh, when you published your your collection on uh, on um, Herbert's essays uh, called uh, I think I have it here. The other, the, other, the other Herbert, and that was a very important essay for me because it uh, before we published it, it was my uh, it was my job talk at Columbia. So uh, and I got oh. the job. So you know, so, so it was a uh, it was a very significant uh, essay for me to write. Um, so uh, so maybe we can start by talking a little about uh, who was speaking of Herbert. What you know, what was? Uh, could you maybe give us a little background to his biography, just in a few words? The beginning of Herbert is definitely uh, one of the most important poets of the second half of the 20th century, and perhaps even in the whole 20th century, and the whole, the entirety of Polish literature. Um, the beginning of Herbert is one of those artists who, like Stanisław Lem, were born in Lwów, and uh, had spent his childhood and, in his case, also World War II uh, uh, there in what is today Lviv uh, in Ukraine. Um, Herbert, his well, his post-war time was more complicated. He changed places. He uh, tried to. He tried to study. He studied economics. He studied philosophy. Uh, he um, also uh, moved from town to town and had some quite um, unsatisfying jobs, uh, especially uh, during uh, Stalinism. Um, out of this experience of uh, of Stalinism in, in Polish culture came a sort of a legend that he actually, that originated from Herbert, that he was not writing in uh, uh, during Stalinism because he would not um, succumb to the Stalinist censorship. Um, Zdzisław Łapiński proved that it was not, he demonstrated literally by finding uh, several poems that um, Herbert published and that were quite uh, well aligned to the official uh, policy. Um, and um, uh, Herbert claimed that, you know, he only wrote to um, the so-called Schuflada, that he only wrote to keep his poems in his in the desk. Death drawer. Yeah. So this was one of the myths that he introduced to to his uh, audience, to his readers. The earlier myth was about his participation in the um, uh, home army uh, military activities, mm -hmm. uh, his membership in that activity, and uh, he was not the worst. Uh, you know, myth creator, confabulant among um, among poets. Nonetheless, um, he was the one who very, very, very quickly and very assertively was uh, corrected. Herbert debuted, at least that's, you know, a, a sort of a consensus. There was the uh, Struna Światła that made his debut. And it was a volume that shows his, um, well, it shows how much he's impacted by older poets. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but he clearly, you know, belongs to, uh, through, uh, through this volume, he belongs to those poets who um, uh, are at the, um, well, avant-garde of the, uh, post-Stalinist uh, uh, culture and poetry. Uh, Herbert then publishes um, a number of uh, volumes. One of his uh, most acclaimed is um, uh, the volume on Mr. Cogito. We will talk about him in, in a minute. We should say about the the, the first volume, Struna Sviatoa, that's uh, 
Uh, it's usually translated um, in English as "court of light" with um, with the British spelling, which I think creates some confusion for American English speakers because "chord" c h o r d usually refers to like several notes, you know, several musical notes played together. But "struna" is literally a string, a chord, like right. in that sense. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, if one doesn't know that, one could easily misread the the title. So. Yeah, we'll right. Proceed. Thank God it's not one of his most popular volumes. <laughs> then we have uh, Mr. Cogito, 19. It's uh, it's the beginning of the 1970s. Uh, he is um, Herbert is very much, um, I would say, uh, attached to the intellectual and artistic milieu of Krakow. He in 1968, I believe. Uh, Marys Katarzyna Dziedusicka uh, in in Paris, I believe. She was then in Paris. And his main passion was um, travel. He traveled in any way he could. He was not a, a person who lo- looked for um, a creature comforts. He would walk when it was necessary. He would sleep on the bench when it was and, um, you know, when there was no other way around. Um, and he was, these visits sometimes uh, uh, to the West, uh, Greece, Italy, France, uh, then Netherlands, uh, sometimes they lasted a few years uh, among many of his uh, longer uh, visits. He goes to California, mm-hmm. becomes a very popular poet, uh, and to the point that a club of Mr. Cogito is created, I think it's still, it's, 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 you know, vestiges, its traces exist somewhere in California, at least in, in, in the web. Um, and um, the, yeah, he was extremely popular. It is the time when his friendship with Czesław Miłosz is uh, taking momentum, uh, and he is also um, um, showing growing um, um, psychological problems uh, that are exacerbated by uh, by his um, um, dependence on um, alcohol. Uh, he returns to Poland in 1992 for good, and they live in the same modest apartment, he and his wife, um, as before, um, have cats and, you know, a cat and a place full of full of uh, books. But strange things are happening, and Herbert is... Um, a, growing hostile to a number of people among them. And uh, I actually have an interview uh, about this with Richard Przybylski, Mm -hmm. who was one of the earliest uh, experts on Herbert and who who, uh, was, uh, at least at that time, that is, um, um, before the return of Herbert, uh, he was a, a proponent of this, of this, of reading Herbert as, as a classicist, mm-hmm. uh, and so he and Yaroslav Marek Rimkiewicz, Przybylski and Yaroslav Marek Rimkiewicz, uh, they were friends. They worked in the same uh, place in the Polish Academy of Sciences and Letters, and they believed that that was the most important aspect of Herbert. Herbert, however. Uh, in the 1990s is a very politicized poet who mm-hmm. is um who uh, produces not only the volume Rovigo but also uh, a um volume of interviews well actually there is it's a volume by Jacek Schnadel uh, who in who interviews among others he interviews Herbert and Herbert offers a very sharp, uh, very um, a brutal, I would even say, critique of 
the Polish intellectuals approach to the uh, communist uh, power. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Przybylski uh, was very deeply offended. Uh, he was not one of those collaborators by no means, but he was offended by Herbert at Herbert's home for very personal reasons. And um, so uh, he decided never ever to uh, to talk to him. Mm. Uh, and there were other uh, situations like this. Herbert was growing, um, was becoming um, uh, uh, full of tensions and anxieties. And there was anger in him. Um, and and of course his uh, attachment to his link uh, to the ultra right party to well to the right let's put it this way to the right political orientation in Poland uh, also um, created huge disappointment among other friends that totally uh, you know uh, left him was Adam Michnik. Um, and um, uh, well, a couple of other people who uh, couldn't uh, just couldn't take it anymore. Herbert was in a sort of a crisis. Um, he um, his interview, especially that interview with Schnadel, in which he, you know, uh, considered a couple of um, Polish intellectuals. Um, a total traitors and just um, a disgusting type of low life, low political life. This really, this really changed his, you know, uh, his um, um, image. <clears throat> On top of this, um, there was the this sort of a very bitter tension. Uh, that he created uh, uh, with uh, Czesław Miłosz. Czesław right. Miłosz, who um, had some sort of a, a, a um, very nasty exchange in, uh, in California at um, Bogdana Carpenter's home. And uh, she talks and she writes about this. Uh, uh, so... Um, we will not. We will not um, repeat what was said then. But of course, the point was political, um, and so Herbert is just gradually um, alienating himself from his older milieu, and uh, at the same time is celebrated by the right. Uh, and this change uh, is enhanced by um, by a poem, uh, in, which is which is a part of the volume Rovigo, in which he um, in which he actually, in a way, denounced uh, Czesław Miłosz as somebody who was too close to Russia, hmm. uh, to put it this way. Uh, well, but let's not dwell in this. Uh, uh, let's <clears throat> let's think about what is still the core yeah. of the image of Zbigniew Herbert, which is just you know um, a, a, a constellation of absolutely wonderful, masterful poems uh, that many of us uh, remember. Among them is. Uh, a poem that became a sort of a, an almost like a manifest of the uh, generation that uh, went through solidarity, its creation, its uh, destruction, and and also through those very dark uh, 1980s, that period of the 1980s, right. um, and it's it's uh, the envoy. Of Mr. Cogito. Would you like to start there? Should we should we look at it? Sure. From the period when 
when Miwosh was uh, and and uh, and Herbert were very close. Of course, this was published in uh, post-war Polish poetry um, in uh, a translation that's by Bogdan and John Carpenter, the envoy of Mr. Kogito. Go where those others went to the dark boundary for the golden fleece of nothingness, your last prize. Go upright among those who are on their knees, among those with their backs turned and those toppled in the dust. You were saved not in order to live. You have little time. You must give testimony. Be courageous when the mind deceives you. Be courageous. In the final account, only this is important. Let your helpless anger be like the sea whenever you hear the voice of the insulted and beaten. Let your sister scorn not leave you. For the informers, executioners, cowards, they will win. They will go to your funeral and with relief will throw a lump of earth. The wood borer will write your smoothed over biography. And do not forgive truly, it is not in your power to forgive in the name of those betrayed at dawn. Beware, however, of unnecessary pride. Keep looking at your clown's face in the mirror. Repeat, I was called. Weren't there better ones than I? Beware of dryness of heart. Love the morning spring, the bird with an unknown name, the winter oak. Light on a wall, the splendor of the sky. They don't need your warm breath. They are there to stay. They are there to say, no one will console you. Be vigilant. When the light on the mountains gives the sign, arise and go. As long as blood turns in the breast, your dark star, repeat old incantations of humanity, fables and legends, because this is how you will attain the good you will not attain. Repeat great words. Repeat them stubbornly like those crossing the desert who perished in the sand. And they will reward you with what they have at hand, with the whip of laughter, with murder on a garbage heap. Go because only in this way will you be admitted to the company of cold skulls, to the company of your ancestors, Gilgamesh, Hector, Roland, the defenders of the kingdom without limit and the city of ashes. Be faithful. Go. So, what did that that mean for the for the solidarity generation? It means that the job is not ended. That the feeling of defeat is not the final feeling. That uh, they have to uh, be faithful, loyal to uh, to their dreams from the late. 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, and, um, and it was a really dark period of great disenchantment in Poland. Um, mm. but, uh, but as we know, it turned to be, um, quite different than, you know, pessimists, the pessimists would think. But here is, but here is a, a certain aspect of Herbert's um, um, worldview. On the one hand, there is this um, deep pessimism and the vision of darkness, of chaos, mm -hmm. uh, but it always somehow is supposed to be conquered by, um, uh, well, uh, Maybe not so ultimately not so rational uh, uh, figure of Mr. Cogito, but by mm. some sort of a primary poetic emotion. People, uh, critics call it philosophy. I'm not sure whether there is such a phenomenon as uh, as Big of Herbert's philosophy, but he definitely he definitely. Um, tried to um, find reasons for, um, well, reasons for his own existence, reasons for joy. And one of the joys, the greatest um, joys of his life, it's constant joie vivre with art. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and what an erudite he was, how he he made mistakes. It's true. All those mistakes by uh, some diligent critics were collected and discussed. Uh, we have records of them, but it's not really the uh, m- most pronounced, prominent part of the Herbert discourse. Herbert discourse is much more affirmative. There's light in it. Yeah, I, I think like, you know, in this, his choice of this, his character and calling him Mr. Cogito, right? I mean, Mr. I think, uh, you know, evoking the the dictum of Descartes, Cogito ergo sum. It's like, it's not just that he thinks, but that he is. It's about, you know, very much being, I think, that's yeah, uh, being I present in the world. Right. But he's also um, uh, evolving, that is, uh, the the uh, the sort of a rational light, the uh, light of reason, is not necessarily the only um, sort of inspiration. He also finds um, another source of a poetic and essayistic inspiration, and these are moments of epiphany. Yes. Of um, there's sudden. Um, ecstasy, euphoria that he is um, that he is um, experiencing when he is in front of the works of art. Very often less known, he mm-hmm. actually repudiates the canon of Western art, like Mona Lisa, but he is very much discovering, like discovering new works of art. One of them is Torrentius's uh, Still right. Life. Um, uh, or some frescoes in uh, um, in in Greek islands, um, and he is Torrentius is still alive, which is like I think the only known poem of known painting of Torrentius, right? Uh, the still yes. life with a bridal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And he, actually, it's a masterful poem, uh, essay in itself, and the story of his. Um, uh, struggle to to um, to find out what is actually the uh, the essence of this poem is is quite fascinating. Uh, I read it in connection with his study of the object as a sort of a um, you know Kantian. Uh, journey to uh, to the essence of the object that, of course, cannot be grasped. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mean his, the poem, the the object, right? Yeah, yeah study of the, the object. Study of the object. Yes, yeah, right. And and the essay on Torrentius, I think, are uh, well. They say they both proclaim a, a journey of the mind and the journey of the heart towards regions that cannot be controlled, Mm -hmm. towards um, uh, nothingness, towards uh, um, darkness, but also eternity. Right. Would you like to look at at another poem? Yes. The the, uh, the poem about Mr. Cogito as a traveler. This is uh, the prayer of the traveler, Mr. Cogito, in the um, collected poems uh, edited by Alyssa Vallas. And I believe this is her translation, since it's one of the later poems. Lord, I thank you for creating the world beautiful and various, and for allowing me in your fathomless goodness to visit places which were not the sites of my daily torments. That at night in Tarquinia, I lay in the square by the well, and a gunmetal pendulum rang out from the tower your wrath or forgiveness. And that a little donkey on the island Corcura sang to me from the unfathomable unfathomable bellows of its lungs, the melancholy of the landscape. (laughs) And that in the ugly city of Manchester, I discovered kind-hearted and sensible people. Nature repeated its wise tautologies. The forest was a forest, the sea, the sea, a cliff, a cliff. Stars revolved, and it was as it ought to be. Jovis omnia plena. 
forgive me, that I thought only of myself while the lives of others, cruel and inexorable, turned around me like the great astrological clock of St. Pierre in Beauvais, that I was lazy, distracted, too timid in labyrinths and caves. And forgive me also that I did not fight like Lord Byron for the happiness of oppressed peoples and studied only the rising moon and museums. I thank you that works created for your greater glory yielded to me particles of their mystery, and that with great presumption I thought that Duccio van Eyck and Bellini painted for me also, and also that the Acropolis, which I never fully understood, patiently revealed to me its mutilated body. I ask you to reward the gray old woman who unbidden brought me fruit from her garden on the sunburned native island of the son of Laertes. And Miss Helen of the foggy island of Mull in the Hebrides for offering Greek hospitality and asking me to leave a lamp lit at night in the window facing Holy Iona so that the lights of earth would greet each other. And also all those who gave me directions and said, Kato Kyrie Kato. And take under your protection, Mama from Spoleto Spiridion, from Paxos, the good student from Berlin who saved me from oppression. And then when met unexpectedly in Arizona, drove me to the Grand Canyon, which is like a hundred thousand cathedrals standing on their heads. Lord, let me not think of my moist-eyed, gray, deluded persecutors when the sun sets on the truly indescribable Ionian Sea. Let me understand other people, other languages, other sufferings, and above all, let me be humble, that is to say, one who longs for the source. I thank you, Lord, for creating the world beautiful and various. And if this is your seduction, I am seduced for good and past all forgiveness. It's a... a very lovely uh, text that is um, an affirmation of simplicity uh, and hospitality mm -hmm. and art and and the moment, the moment that is um, passing, but uh, is somehow uh, somehow uh, reflected in uh, in the. Uh, in the memory and in, in, in this particular poem, uh, Herbert was indeed an avid traveler. Yes. And he really reached on his legs um, uh, the places that a, a person, as a connoisseur of art, such as he was, should see with his eyes. He really was very attached to this direct experience of of art. He didn't want to see art through the media. Uh, this kind of, any kind of transfer of mediation uh, somehow would falsify his aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. And so he would, he would travel uh, tirelessly and, and he would draw. Yes, he would sketch, right? I must admit that. Uh, well, he is. He his uh, drawings are not like, let's say, Czesław Miłosz's doodles. Mm -hmm. He's more like a nineteenth-century traveler. Uh, well, definitely better than Shelley, closer to Brodsky. His drawings are very delicate. And usually there are parts of Italian landscape architecture and uh, sometimes works of art. Um, yes, that's, that's what uh, filled his life and that's what gave him the, um, those emotions that were so, uh, um, so necessary for him. He didn't own any great works of art. He had to travel to them. And this was for him uh, a condition of a modern um, pilgrim. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was definitely, many of his travels are described as pilgrimages with this sense of ascending, with the sense of reaching some high objective. Uh, and it, uh, 
a metaphysical experience, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my my vision of Herbert. There are other um, uh, completely different opposing visions. One of them was uh, articulated in uh, Stanisław Barańczak's uh, uh, volume, The Fugitive from Utopia, Uciekinier uh, z uh, Utopii, in which he rejects... I have it here. Right? Yes, yes. yes in which he rejected the uh, all the Mediterranean philosophical values mm -hmm. as a sort of a... Um, nest, philosophical nest for Herbert and his poetry. And he he focused on on this on this gesture of rejection, of uh, deconstructing, if you will, um uh, the uh, the positive uh somehow light vision of history and world. Mm -hmm. He was also rejected. That is uh <laughs> Um, uh, Berenczak's uh, approach was rejected. But thinking about, you know, about Herbert as a traveler, I mean, um, a traveler connected to art. I mean, it, it, it invites like comparisons to Walter Pater, who would you know, travel and write about art as a way of making it available, who didn't have the privilege of travel. And, uh, and of course, uh, Herbert, you know, came from you know, a place where people didn't have the have the privilege uh, of travel. Did, did he see himself as having that kind of mission, do you think, or was it purely personal? He traveled like Pater. That is, he traveled like the 19th century poets. He traveled like Byron. Actually, mm -hmm. for uh, some time, he traveled in, in Greece, uh, around Greece, uh, Greek islands, uh, with his friends uh, from uh, England who had a, a boat. Um, and so he, he traveled in many possible ways. Uh, but... Um, I don't think it was just to fulfill and enrich himself. Yeah, it was. It was uh, also to uh, to convey his experiences to those who were not so lucky to have a passport during the Polish People's Republic. Uh, how did he come uh, to have the... a passport? Do you know. Oh, you know, you could if you had an invitation. Mm -hmm. from a uh, foreign institution or a person who would sponsor you, who mm -hmm. would send you an invitation and sponsorship was somehow guaranteed, you could get it. Since 1956, I remember this was the time when my family could travel mm -hmm. to France uh, and, and the whole family would go, like, you know, the whole, you know, a whole group of people, mm -hmm. and they returned. So mm -hmm. uh, Poland is different than other countries in the communist system, and certainly different than the Soviet Union. Right, right. Uh, there are those connections. There are, you know, Herbert goes not only to to uh, experience art, to to have those unique um, feelings, uh, but he also goes to to Paris to uh, to meet Chapsky, to meet people from you know the Cultura uh, uh, circle to uh, to meet uh, to continue his uh, uh, relationship with uh, Czesław Miłosz, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, he um, had a very uh, solid friendship. Uh, with his translators. Mm -hmm. And of course, the carpenters uh, belong to this group. Uh, but um, it seems to me that, and I, and I am not now not talking about, about uh, the carpenters, but there was a number of translators and friends around the world with whom those relationships, uh, you know, those the friendship went sour. Mm. And it is it, it just rem the story of his friendships reminds me the um, that observation made by Derrida that you know a, the inherent in friendship mm -hmm. is its loss, mm. its its demise, and uh, that that definitely was the case 
who is uh, with, with Herbert, a very human condition. He can see uh, how he, in his poetic voice, talks about his inner tensions and his inner anxieties and and uh, uh, paradoxes mm-hmm. of his Do you character. have another poem you wanted to look at? Yes, if you could read the uh, poem about Mr. Cogito's two legs. Oh, sure. Um, let me find it. Um, all right. we, have, we have this one in uh, the Carpenter's uh, collection, uh, Mr. Cogito. Um, and uh, in their version, it's called About Mr. Cogito's Two Legs. The left leg normal, one could say optimistic, a little too short, boyish, with exuberant muscles and a well-shaped calf. The right leg, God help us, thin, with two scars, one along the Achilles tendon, the other oval, pale pink, shameful reminder of an escape. The left, inclined to leap, ready to dance, loving life too much to expose itself. The right, nobly rigid, sneering at danger. In this way, on two legs, the left, which can be compared to Sancho Panza, and the right, recalling the wandering night, Mr. Cogito goes through the world, staggering slightly. (laughs) Yes, indeed. So uh, we have a a construct of the uh, poetic, uh, uh, this poetic figure, Mr. Cogito, who is actually uh, quite paradoxical and full of contradictions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have, we have this, this basic awareness of the inner contradictions that are definitely problematic uh, in the in the case for for Cogito in Cogito's case, but what is so interesting about this poem is the humorous, slightly ironic tone. Mm-hmm. And so here is my question: Is this irony with which Cogito is described? Is it a way of revealing? his complexities, his contradictions, or rather the way of, you know, uh, not ignoring them, but just like, you know, writing about them and sort of solving the problem in this way. Yes, Cogito is this way, but he manages to survive. He goes through the world in this very uneven uh, you know, a trait. So what with is, his imperfections. Is it really, yes, because the irony in this poem, self-irony is so mm. um sometimes cruel. Mm. Uh, I think that it's it's a way of really um expressing his uh his whatever guilty feelings he has and and creating a sort of solution for himself. We have such a temptation to read Mr. Koguto um, autobiographically, right? To you know, say that this is, but it's, it's his self outside of himself, right? I mean, it's not exactly himself. Yes, absolutely. I am not thinking about her, but I'm, I, I hope I'm using such scholarly terms of the, as the poetic voice. And of course, Kogito. Kogito is a figure, a very complicated figure construct that uh, helped Herbert to utilize the car, but also to reject him mm. and to uh, show the you know the shallowness and impossibility of uh, of being fully rational in, in this very complicated world. So uh, yeah, I would say I would agree with Edward Hirsch who says that. He that Herbert was really post Cartesian. Mm-hmm. What is again very challenging for a scholar is that his irony sometimes is so subtle that we may simply miss it, that mm-hmm. we may not grasp it. And which is, you know, I, I, I recall that new critics, uh, and one of them actually. Uh, a professor here at the UFC said that irony is so difficult to grasp 
that actually it, in a sense, escapes definitions. Um, so if we would now, thinking about this, uh, the irony is, is difficult to grasp. Uh, if we would now read the, uh, his his poem, uh, The Elegy for Fortin Brass, Oh, sure. I we, think yes. it would be a good illustration of of uh, this problem. So, the elegy of Fortinbras was uh, was uh, Herbert's first poem published in English translation by uh, Czesław Miłosz um, in a magazine which has no connection to the show called uh, Encounter uh, in 1961, um, which was a, a magazine of the kind of the 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 left, but the anti-Stalinist left, um, edited by uh, Stephen Spender and and Irving Kristol, um, which was later revealed to have um, covert CIA funding as part of uh, part of uh, American, um, uh, American soft power, American uh, cultural diplomacy. Uh, but, you know, would that the government fund such wonderful projects as, as, uh, as Stephen Spender's magazine, like uh, like uh, like Irving Crystal? I, I think, you know, we tend to say, oh, it was funded by the CIA. It must be bad. But I'd rather say, well, maybe there was something enlightening in the <laughs> enlightened in the CIA at that time that uh, that uh, that they funded art and they funded poetry. Elegy of Fortinbras for CM, whom we can take to be Czesław Miłosz. Now that we're alone, we can talk prince man to man. Though you lie on the stairs and see no more than a dead ant, nothing but black sun with broken rays, I could never think of your hands without smiling. And now that they lie on the stone like fallen nests, they are as defenseless as before. As before. The end is exactly this. The hands lie apart, the sword lies apart, the head apart, and the knight's feet in soft slippers. You will have a soldier's funeral without having been a soldier, the only ritual I am acquainted with a little. There will be no candles, no singing, only cannon fuses and bursts. Crepe dragged on the pavement, helmets, boots, artillery, horses, drums, drums, I know nothing exquisite. Those will be my maneuvers before I start to rule. One has to take the city by the neck and shake it a bit. Anyhow, you had to perish, Hamlet. You were not for life. You believed in crystal notions, not in human clay, always twitching as if asleep you hunted chimeras. Wolfishly, you crunched the air only to vomit. You knew no human thing. You did not know even how to breathe. Now you have peace, Hamlet. You accomplished what you had to, and you have peace. The rest is not silence, but belongs to me. You chose the easier part, an elegant thrust, but what is heroic death compared with eternal watching? With a cold apple in one's hand on a narrow chair, with a view of the anthill and the clock's dial. Adieu, Prince, I have tasks, a sewer project, and a decree on prostitutes and beggars. I must also elaborate a better system of prisons, since, as you justly said, Denmark is a prison. I go to my affairs. This night is born a star named Hamlet. We shall never meet. What I shall leave will not be worth a tragedy. It is not for us to greet each other or bid farewell. We live on archipelagos. And that water, these words, what can they do? What can they do, Prince? Fortin Brass is portrayed as the you know, the, the brutal and practical ruler um, in comparison Positivist to, in action. Yeah. And yeah, and Hamlet is an idealist. Yeah. This is a poem that uh, addresses some of the oldest Polish complexes. Mm-hmm. One of them being this uh, this tension between uh, romanticism and all anti-romantic utilitarian uh, values. Uh, and since uh, Herbert belongs to the generation of the 1920s, those artists were born in the 1920s, you know, he, he uh, inherited as a part of his histor- historical experience uh, what happened during the uh, Warsaw Uprising of 1944 uh, as, you know, as a, a, a lesson in, in, in futility. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
bad futility that was heroic and beautiful. And so that's that's also a part of the contextual reading for this poem. But it's also the beauty of the phrase, the way he uses, on the one hand, uh, just a very casual, colloquial uh, type of idiom to finish with an idiom that is slightly melancholic, but also definitely uh, belongs to a high style. Uh, that's that's the ending. Uh, and um, I think that the irony in this poem is more for Tim Brass's self-irony. He has sewers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Sewers, prostitutes, and beggars, right? Right. I mean, that that that's uh, you know, but that's yeah, and that's it's my social program. Sewers, <laughs> prostitutes, and beggars. I, I have to deal with this. So he rejects also idealism as uh, a an approach that doesn't consider uh, prostitutes and sewers um, to be valuable or you know to be important. Uh, very interesting, a very interesting uh, juxtaposition of two uh, life philosophies. Maybe we could we could uh, end our uh, our discussion of Herbert um, on this uh, one of his early poems uh, from um, uh, Hermes, the Dog and the Star, I believe, from, oh, from wonderful. 19, 1957, uh, called "I Would Like to Describe," um, which says something about you know. The job of the poet, I think. Um, I would like to, and I believe this would be uh, probably Miłosz and Peter Dale Scott's uh, translation, since it's one of the early ones that's in the collected poems um, edited by Elisa Vallis. I would like to describe the simplest emotion, joy or sadness, but not as others do, reaching for the shafts of rain or sun. I would like to describe a light which is being born in me, but I know it does not resemble any star, for it is not so bright, not so pure, and it is uncertain. I would like to describe courage without dragging behind me a dusty lion, and also anxiety without shaking a glass full of water. To put it another way, I would give all metaphors in return for one word, drawn out of my breast like a rib for one word contained within the boundaries of my skin. But apparently this is not possible. And just to say, I love, I run around like mad, picking up handfuls of birds and my tenderness, which after all is not made of water, asks the water for a face and anger different from fire borrows from it a loquacious tongue. So is blurred, so is blurred in me, what white haired gentleman separated once and for all and said, this is the subject and this is the object. We fall asleep with one hand under our head and with the other in a mound of planets. Our feet abandon us and taste the earth with their tiny roots, which next morning we tear out painfully. Does he reject metaphor? No. No, I didn't think so either. (laughs) He tries. It's not his favorite uh, um, tool. I think that a parable is Mm -hmm. his favorite tool. it was perhaps conditioned by, again, by the political situation in Poland. If you wanted to convey, to communicate some contemporary problems, he had to reach back to uh, to ancient myths, yeah, and to and then adapt them in a way that uh, his intentions. We're clear. He longs for transparency, transparency of the word, but it's not possible under the circumstances. I think that in this case, um, Tadeusz Różewicz mm-hmm. uh, was a stronger poet. That is, Tadeusz Różewicz was all for minimalist mm-hmm. uh, language and, and simplicity, and he was faithful to this to this uh, poetics. Uh, Herbert was, like Mr. Cogito, not consistent. <laughs> but 
but that's all right. So um, on that note, let me let me ask you. So what what are you working on now? You you've been uh, you've been uh, uh, you've had a residency at Bard College. Is that continuing or is that just for uh, I'm going for the fall? Uh, this was for the fall. Now I'm going in in uh, uh, in the winter quarter. I I will be teaching. I will be teaching uh, a course at, at, at Bard. Typically. No, here. Oh, at, at, at Chicago. Yeah, a course that is, became quite popular and um, is actually, the registrar said it's a popular course because mm -hmm. it fills, the enrollment is filled uh, during the first two weeks mm -hmm. of the enrollment period. Anyhow, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a course about objects, bodies, objects, and cognition. Mm -hmm. and and uh, of course, uh, uh, Herbert is one of the authors that we discuss. Mm -hmm. But we also discuss uh, the um, a, a novel, one of the darkest modernist novels, Piotrusz by Leo oh. Lich. It just came out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was published by the Vine Editions. Yes. And... And uh, it was translated by Anna Zaranko. Mm -hmm. It's an excellent translation. And uh -huh. oh, what Lipsky is doing with the body and how he is objectifying uh, the human existence is is really um, quite frightful. Um, but anyway, uh, the novel is there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Line Editions is an interesting new publisher. They're very interested yeah. in in uh, in uh, Polish translation text and yes. translation uh, translation from Polish, particularly. Particularly, I've been yes. in touch with the uh, with the editor who uh, who used to be at Northern Illinois University Press when they adopted many Polish titles. Um, so. Yes, um, me too. Yeah, so uh, it's good to see that happening. It's good to see the the work being adopted uh, in a course. Well, Alex Schwartz. Alex, Alex Schwartz, yes, yes. He he was also here at the University of Chicago. I, yeah, I uh, he asked me because we knew each other. He he asked me to to write the introduction to to Piotrusz. So uh, and this prompted me the work on Lipski prompted me to spend the spring quarter in Toruń at mm. the um, Mikołaj Kopernikus, Uni Nicolas Copernicus University, where, you know, there is this center for uh, diasporic exilic literature. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting, a huge archive. And they have uh, almost, well, they have the stuff uh, from Lipski and his, and you know uh, his correspondence. So I, that's what I will be doing in the spring. Oh, that's wonderful. We uh, we we should do a, an episode on Lipsky now that uh, Piotrusz is out. So um, maybe I, I think we're. I don't think we have it on next year's agenda. But maybe the following year we'll get there uh, if we're uh, if we're still at this. Uh, so which I hope we will be. So uh, so thanks again so much for uh, for joining us. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure. Hang on. Please subscribe and click the bell to stay on top of the program. Watch the credits for some recommendations about how you can support aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. I'd like to thank all the people who helped make this series possible. The Polish Cultural Institute New York sponsors our program. Bartek Remisko, Head of Humanities and Literature at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, is our executive producer. Natalia Iudin is my fellow producer and editor. Our opening and closing music is by Radek Przepowski. Thank you all for listening and for reading along with us. Let's meet again in a month when we'll be talking about one of the great satirists of particular importance in the last decade of the communist regime in Poland, Sławomir Mrożek. See you then. Tak szare, tak płaskie są domy ludzi pojazdy.